Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Today we are looking at Aegon II, that guy, one of the central characters of the Dance of the Dragons, and yet also one of the the characters who are not actually at the heart of this. This always feels like a battle between the Greens and the Blacks, but although, yes, he's the figurehead for Team Green, for a lot of what is going on, he's not the person driving the action. So we'll dig into that in just one moment. But whatever, he is one of the most important characters in the entire history of the Targaryens. So we'll look at him. Um, as always, what I'll try and do is uh, shape this live stream around questions that I get from my patrons. I'll try and pick up as many questions as I can from uh, the chat as we're going through. Um, but I thought I'd start with a sort of an, an overview of uh, his life. We get a little bit, obviously, from House of the Dragon, but he was born in the year 107 uh, after the conquest. He is the first, firstborn child of Alicent and King Viserys, the firstborn son. And that, from his very birth, meant that a lot of people that he should be king. However, as we know, Viserys held on to this idea that Rhaenyra should be inheriting. So the question is, what did he think about this? Now, all the way through the build-up to the Dance of the Dragons, we're never really given an insight into his mind. We hear what Alicent wants, we hear what Otto wants, we hear what Kristen Cole wants, we don't hear what he wants, until we get to the, the final moment where Team Green is launching its coup. And at that point, they discover him. In, on the show, they squashed everything down into one day. In the books, this is over several days, the Green Council took a long time to figure out what to do. And once they did, they realised they didn't know where Aegon was. And then they went to try and find him. And when they found him, apparently it, his reaction was that he wasn't the heir. Rhaenyra was the heir. He didn't actually want to be king. That does seem to change as we get into the Dance of the Dragons. Um, once he's declared king... And then, fundamentally, once we get Aemond striking the first blow of the Dance of the Dragons, we see this at the very end of the last episode of Season 1 of House of the Dragon, when we get um, Aeg uh, Aemond on Vagar killing off Lupiliceris on Alex. And when he comes back, and presumably we'll see this in Season 2 of House of the Dragon, and this point i should probably give the usual spoiler warning the spoiler policy on this channel is book spoilers are okay because house of the dragon oh sorry because fire and blood has been out for a few years show spoilers are not okay i don't have any show spoilers i do not know what they're going to be doing in season two of house of the dragon but obviously they will probably be sticking relatively closely to the books so I'll tell you what happens in the books, and it's up to you whether you think that is what is going to happen on the show. So in the books, after Aemond comes back and says, hey, I've killed one of the bastard strong boys, we're told that Alicent and Otto were up in arms. What have you done? How could you... I mean, Otto, we're told, says, how could you have been so blind? You've only lost one eye. You've not lost both eyes this is only going to lead to bad things. But we're told that Aegon is his brother with a feast. Finally, he says, battle is joined. This is... Uh, it's going to be hard to see how they do that on the show because Aegon on the show at this point is not really even wanting to be king. He's not really in favour of this war. He, maybe he's been turned around by, if you saw that um, ceremony there in episode 9 when he was crowned king, he did seem to get a gleam in his eye. But in the book, by this stage, he's absolutely up for it. So, um, he is, from that moment on, 
absolutely dedicated to this war. We then see the revenge of Team Black. And the revenge of Team Team Black, blood and cheese, it's going to be a massive moment on the show. Um, so another spoiler warning here. But blood and cheese will lead to the death of one of Aegon's children. At which point, Aegon suddenly seems to step up a gear. He gets really animated in wanting to get on the front foot, not just sit there in King's Landing and say, hey, I'm the king. Um, if you want to claim the throne, come at me. That's not what his stance is. He's really wanting to go on the front foot here. And his grandfather, Otto, has a lot more... Um, nuanced of an approach, a lot more paced of an approach. His grandfather Otto is writing to people, trying to strike alliances. In particular, he's trying to get um, the uh, Essos and the free cities onto his side. Um, and Aegon doesn't like this. We read in the book that there's this long period of not much going on until finally he into his grandfather Otto's study, sees him there writing another letter, and he just smashes the ink pot off of his desk, and he says, you should be spilling blood, not ink. And you can tell he's boiling with anger. Is this because of his son being killed? We, we don't know. He never seemed to be particularly close to his son or any of his children or his wife, but something within him seems to have snapped. The next time we hear about him, he's there. Otto is in, uh, in the Green Council and Aegon snatches his, uh, his chain of office, the hand of the king. He snatches it from him and he hands it to Kristen Cole. Kristen Cole is not going to sit around waiting. Kristen Cole is there with all of these big ideas, with all of these big plans, and basically Otto from that moment on is pushed into the background. Aegon now and Kristen Cole and Aemond go on to the offensive. What we will see, I'm guessing probably episode maybe three of season two, we're going to see the Battle of Rook's Rest. Kristen Cole goes out with the army, tempting out Rhaenys, who we saw. Rhaenys on her dragon, uh, Melis, is patrolling around Blackwater Bay and the, 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 the parts, the nearer parts, the hither parts that, of Westeros. And he's there, he attacks the the towns north of Westeros and she cannot resist. She comes in, she starts attacking what looks like an an unprotected army. At which point the trap is sprung. Aemond on Vagar and Aegon on um uh, his uh, his dragon suddenly come out sunfires, come out, launch their trap. Rhaenys realises all is lost. She directs her dragon, Melis, to go and take out Sunfire. And then Vagar comes down and takes out both of them, basically. Vagar is massive compared to those two dragons. Now, Rhaenys and Melis die. Aegon himself suffers huge wounds. He's burned. Half of his body is burned. Many of his, um, I think he has a broken hip, hip, a broken leg. He's he's in a really bad shape. His dragon, Sunfire, who we're told was the most beautiful dragon ever to, to be seen in Westeros, is crippled, basically. He cannot fly. One wing, uh, basically a broken arm, a broken wing, cannot fly. It's just stay, he has to stay there. Aegon himself is taken back to King's Landing. And for the next six months, year or so, he is out of action. He is in so much pain, they start giving him milk of the poppy. He's hardly ever there. We're told that he's asleep for nine hours out of ten. They even give his crown to Aemon. This is something to watch out for, because I suspect most, most of the um, show-only people and probably quite a lot of the book-only people 
haven't quite twigged how big a shift is going to happen here is that the very crown is going to be passed from Aegon over to Aemond. Now, Aemond never says that he is king. He stars himself. I think it's Lord Protector, but he is the person who is now running the show. Aegon stays in this uh, almost catatonic state for quite a long time until we get to the moment where Aemond, Kristen Cole overreach themselves and then King's Landing falls. Aegon is saved. The other uh, members, his his siblings, are also his children, also saved, taken out from King's Landing. Laris Strong saves King Aegon. He saves him by sending him to Dragonstone, the last place that uh, Rhaenyra and Co would ever possibly think to be looking at their home base, and he goes there disguised um, and just stays there hidden for probably the next six months or so until Sunfire, his dragon, Sunfire reappears. Now, Sunfire had been there at Rook's Rest, just a little bit north of King's Landing, until some um, brave knights decided, well, we should probably try and kill off this dragon. They failed, and Sunfire manages to just fly away. Not not far, just like hopping, basically, 10 miles, then another 10 miles, then another 10 miles. And Sunfire manages to escape. Where to, we're never told exactly, but probably to Cracklaw Point, which is, if you have an imaginary map of Westeros in front of you, it's that just sort of north of King's Landing, there's a sort of a, uh, a long, spindly bit of uh, woodland caves that is... Um, uh, often ignored, really, in politics in Westeros. As far as we can tell, Sunfire goes there. Until, at some point, Sunfire gets enough energy, recovers enough, to go back to Dragonstone. Now, I've got questions on this, but um, we don't know the exact extent to which this was just trying to go home, or this is the call of Aegon, their bond was so strong. He flies back to Dragonstone, hides in a cave, Aegon finds him, and this is the point at which Aegon decides, you know what, let's launch a coup here. Let's take Dragonstone. So, while the main bit of action of this story is happening elsewhere, our attention, everyone's attention, is what's going on in King's Landing. Rhaenyra is losing control. What's going on with Daemon? Daemon and Aemon are fighting over the God's Eye Lake. What's going on with the armies? Oh, there's this massive battles going on over Tumbleton. While all of that is going on, we get Aegon, who is inexplicably there on Dragonstone, that everybody thinks is the heartland of Team Black. He then control of Dragonstone, at which point Rhaenyra, having been thrown out from, from King's Landing, heads back, limping to Dragonstone herself, to find that her stronghold is actually held by her enemy. Aegon is there. Aegon is cruel. He he kills her. He feeds her to her own dragon, to his own dragon. Um, and um, then we get the moment where we think, okay, so Aegon's in control, but he still has enemies. The although Rhaenyra may have gone, Aegon the Third is captured. Team Black are not giving up; they're still fighting out in the field, all over the place. There are loyalists all over Westeros, and. So Aegon II has to start bargaining with some people. Corlys Velaryon is there, has control of the waters. He strikes a deal. Eventually, the idea is, is there that, um, uh, that his daughter is going to marry Aegon III, um, who is, of course, Rhaenyra's son. This is how the two families are going to be joined together. A deal is struck. He manages to get back to King's Landing. But when he gets back to King's Landing, he shows no mercy. 
absolutely no mercy. He just like kills absolutely anyone who was on the opposing side. While this is happening, armies are descending on King's Landing. The the sensible people, the grown-ups, as we probably would call them these days, look around and go, you know what? His time has reached his end. And they try and talk to him, Corliss, Laris Strong. Um, they they try to talk to him and say, you know what, we can we can end this now. All you have to do is offer peace terms to everyone and we can end this. He's having none of it. And he gets poisoned. Who is he poisoned by? Again, we'll look at that in a, a little bit later. But it's very clear that it's the powers that be within King's Landing. He is killed. He had a chance to rule. He had a chance to thrive and survive. But ultimately, it was his own cruelty and it's his own vengeance that prevented that from happening. After his death, we get the heir of the wolf, and then we get the regency of Aegon III. The Targaryen rule goes on. He is the person, he, one of the, his most, um, I mean, understated, but probably important from our understanding of history's perspective, rulings was to say that Rhaenyra, who ruled for six months in King's Landing, should be expunged from the list of the rulers of uh, from Targaryen rulers. So we never talk of Queen Rhaenyra. We just talk about King Aegon II. But was he ever the undisputed king of the Seven Kingdoms? No, not at all. Um, but he ruled and his rule decided the winners decide on history. So that is his role. Will he be judged? well or was he judged well no absolutely not um going back through history the few times he's mentioned in the, the histories in the song of ice and fire it's never in a positive light he's not seen as a good and wise ruler of westeros so that's the sort of the overarching um history of aegon the second um he never comes across well we will dig into his character as we go through this live stream but he never comes across well he is not a good king he never rules an undivided kingdom and when he is sitting on the iron throne although fundamentally he never really sat on the iron throne because when he came back he was just too injured to tortured even to climb up the steps to the iron throne but when he did rule he did not rule with justice or kindness or pity so let's go in and have a quick look at the uh, the chat uh, mm saying reinera alison thoughts this is the first super chat from mm uh, thank you so much uh, reinera alison thoughts so um i don't know what the the detail of that one is but um i think we always have to remember with rainier and allison is that the show deliberately changed the ages here this is one of the biggest list but biggest changes that the show made which was in the book when allison married viserys then we get rainier she was 18 rainier was nine they never were these teenage besties that we sort of saw on the show. Now, I'm I'm actually all right with that change. I think it worked really well on the show to have them having this close connection meant that at the end of the season, there was a really strong payoff where the two of them, it suddenly was personal between them, not, not this kind of um, uh, generational difference that was there in the book but this was actually friends who were on the wrong side so um i think it it worked well on the show i i mean it worked well in the book but it was a different dynamic but on the show this added that extra element um question from um, Andrew Cage is saying as a sort of an overarching point saying I do think the House of the Dragon portrayed Aegon II well and true to the text 
bit of an unlikable bad egg, but initially quite reluctant assuming power. Yeah, I mean, I think those things are definitely true. Um, question from Richard Smith saying, no slight to the Reese fans, but if the corollary to Matt Smith's much more nuanced portrayal of Damon seems to be that Otto is more cynical and shallow in his motivations. Um, I'm a big Reese Evans fan, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, I've seen him live on stage. And he's fabulous as an actor. Um, so I think he did what he was asked to do. Um, in terms of the uh, actor's interpretation, we've heard a lot from Matt Smith in terms of his interpretation of Damon. And they made a clear decision there that his prime motivation was his love for his family over his love of power. We've heard slightly less, I think, from Lisa fans on this. I would love to hear his take on the, on uh, Otto. But um, the, um, the, the way that they decided to portray Alicent, I think, meant that it put him in, in a, a much clearer villain role. The desire to create Alicent, or to create for Alicent uh, a more sympathetic perspective, means that we have to see him in Otto as a lot more manipulative. So I think these are, these are decisions made by the showrunners relatively early on. And I think Reese Fans did a very good job. I think he showed that. Um, but I think he showed it in a very understated way. It would have been very easy, I think, to put within that context Otto as this kind of um, moustache twirling evil villain who is behind all of this. But I think he did the whole thing in a very understated way. And I suspect we, when we get to season two of House of the Dragon, I don't know whether they will make us sympathetic to Otto, but certainly in the book, this is the point at which he gets shunted aside. They've already shown that Team Green has some differences of personality, differences of approach. Otto is going to be the one who is there going, okay, well, I think I can win this with gaining allies, the slow burn approach. And the people who push him to one side are the people like Amond and Kristen Cole who are there going, no, no, let's just go out on the attack. And initially it looks like they got it right. The Battle of Rook's Rest looks like a victory. But in the longer term, their approach of charging out and just taking on the enemy proved to be wrong. So I do wonder whether on the show they will give us an interpretation of Otto that is not, not necessarily sympathetic, but allows us to see him as being the clever one amongst a group of people who are just hotheads trying to win a war. Um, so I, I think that we will get an extra layer of nuance on his character as we go through. Uh, let's go to a question from... Uh, oh, Luna Cascade, one of uh, the uh, channel members here. Hi there, Luna Cascade, saying, uh, question, in the show, Aegon seems to want to be loved. When the small folk cheered, he wanted the rule. Needy for attention and love, is that accurate? Um, yes. I mean, we're not told exactly this. We are told that before he was crowned, he didn't want to be king. But then after the death of his son, suddenly he's there wanting to go on the front foot, wanting to attack. So something shifted. Was it the death of his son? Nothing we've seen suggests that he was a particularly caring father. Um, was it just a fight for survival? Very possibly. Um, but uh, was it 
as they seemed to be going down this route on House of the Dragon, was it that he just realised how good it was to be king? Um, having the people cheer him. Again, that's possible. I suspect the reality is quite multi-layered. It's not just a thing here. But there was a shift. There was a clear shift in who he was beforehand and who he was afterwards in, in just a matter of a few days. So um, is he needy? We never see that in the books. We don't get to see and understand that in the books. In the books, uh, when I say the books, it's the book, basically, Fire and Blood. It, he's always this secondary character, where which is really odd given the fact that he is the he's the focus, he's the the main candidate that or the candidate that Team Green put up. But we get the Green Council. He's not there. They don't even talk to him. They they spend days with the Green Council discussing amongst themselves how are we going to do this? How are we going to launch this coup? How are we going to put Aegon on the throne? How are we going to deal with Rhaenyra? What about the people he support? They go through all of these different things. They don't, they don't get in contact with Aegon at all. They don't talk to him. He's not actually part of their inner circle. So he isn't a focus of the book. He remains a bit of a mystery. So we have to fill in a few of the gaps here. And I think the show at the moment are doing a, a really good job of that. Um, Mara Lee. Uh, hi there, Mara. Saying a proud channel member and patron. Just a show of love and support and appreciation for the fabulous stories and merch and videos. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mara. You know how much I uh, appreciate all of your support. Um, and I have a question. Oh, Marley again, uh, saying for all the royal Targaryen women and queens left out by the ma maesters in the history books, this is for you, ladies. Well, absolutely. Yes. So one of the things I'm trying to do in this series of um, Targaryen rulers as live streams is to try and pick up what I think George R. R. Martin was trying to show us in Fire and Blood. The uh, the women. The female Targaryens who either actually did rule or should have ruled but were written out of the history books. When you get that list of rulers, it's all men all the way through. Um, but in Fire and Blood, George R. R. Martin very, very clearly tries to show us Rhaenyra was queen for six months. She ruled in King's Land. She was just excluded. Uh, when you get Queen Alyssa, she ruled jointly effectively with uh, Jaehaerys that some of the most famous laws from that era came from her when we get Aegon's sister wives they ruled jointly in fact they sat on the Iron Throne probably between them more than he did um, and you keep on going down the queen who never was Arya who probably well she was twice the heir to the Iron Throne um, we keep on coming down through the generations. There are there are women, female Targaryens, who were deliberately excluded from the histories that we were first told about the Targaryens. So that's one of the things I'm trying to do and pick up on in this series is to show not just the people who sat on the Iron Throne, but the people who should have sat on the Iron Throne, the people whose stories were... Uh, that of the leaders within the Targaryens. Um, question from, uh, I think I had another one. I can try and find it. Uh, AK Channel TV saying, I don't remember Book Aegon ever say, uh, ever um, uh, so, saying anyone ever. Also, I hope you know that Sir Christian is behind you. Don't stand up or criticize Aegon. Yeah, he's, I, I know he's up here somewhere. Um, so um, he's... Book Aegon is a mystery to us, basically. Um, I think is the, the only real way of looking at it. We see him just in what he does. We certainly don't ever have any POV from him. We don't have that for anyone in Fire and Blood. Um, but the maesters rarely even wonder what he's thinking. Um, 
they they ponder lots about what was motivating Damon or or why what why did Rhaenyra do what she did? What about Alicent? They don't ever really get into the mind of Aegon. He's almost like this kind of side uh, script, just like there. Okay, so this yes, this is the person that they wanted to be king, which does give the impression that they weren't expecting when he ruled that he would actually rule. The clear impression is that Otto thought that he would be ruling basically in his stead, hand of the king, his grandfather, he would be the person actually doing the ruling. Um, it's just that events got in the way. Uh, uh, Tatanuts saying, does the fate of Aegon II foreshadow the fate of Phaegon? Or any other ice and fire characters? Um, well, quite possibly. The so um, Fagon, <coughs> pardon me. Fagon, for those who do not know, is he's a he's a book only character who uh, gets introduced as being uh, or claiming to be Aegon the long-lost heir, the, the heir that thought to be killed by the Targaryens during Robert's Rebellion. And um, the claim is that he got rescued by Varys, and now he spent his time over in Essos learning how to be a great king, and now he's returning to claim the throne. And he, in the books, has started his invasion. He's got the Golden Company on his side, he's apparently taking Storm's End, this is quite a big deal. He's got there before Daenerys. So um, how will he die? Is there any foreshadowing for him here? Um, I I suspect this is going to be the foreshadowing we seem to have from um, when Daenerys went into uh, the House of the Undying. The uh, the foreshadowing does seem to be that she will show the lie. She almost certainly actually isn't Aegon, which is why people in the community call him Aegon, fake Aegon. Uh, he almost certainly isn't. He probably is a black fire pretender. She will probably show him up for what he is. I suspect that and i don't i don't know if i have any real evidence for this this is just a gut instinct does that make it tinfoil i don't know you decide i suspect that danny will wish some sort of evidence that he is targaryen and will introduce him to her dragons and he will probably get um the, the same fate as Quentin Martell, who gets burned by a dragon. I suspect Quentin will be foreshadowing. That's the, the, his role. When you break it down, if you look at what was happening to him all the way through, did it achieve anything? What is the point of his role? I'm going to ask a slight question here, but for book people, this is quite important. Quentin, he got his own chapters, he got his POV chapters, he went over as an emissary from the Martells to Daenerys, he, he wants to marry her, um, he wants to tame a dragon, and he gets burned and he dies. Why did George R. R. Martin include that in the story? There's only two possible reasons. The first is the, the impact when Doran finds out what happened which and he will because um we we get sir barristan who's always trying to do the right thing bless him but in this instant probably doesn't actually help he's sending the bones back to Doran martel with a little cover note that says oh hi sir here's here's your son's um bones um just so you know he got burned by a dragon uh, by one of Daenerys's dragons. Uh, Daenerys refused to marry him, and, you know, she's also gone missing. We don't know where she is. Uh, so when Doran gets that note, and then Doran finds out that there's another person claiming to be a Targaryen who has actually and actively invaded 
Westeros, I think we know where Doran is going to put his support. So that is definitely the first point. The second point is maybe this is foreshadowing. Maybe this is foreshadowing for some a more important character who is going to try to bond with a dragon and they're not going to succeed. So my guess is that it's not that Aegon himself is going to be foreshadowing for Phaegon, but that being burned by a dragon, which is what Aegon did to uh, Rhaenyra, will, in a manner of speaking, be foreshadowing. Um, uh, Renabe Amitra saying, I hope you're well, Robert. I am, thank you very much. Uh, can we say that the High Tower's attempts to come close to the throne ended with Aegon the Second's death and up the tricky uh, Eric Chan Harper Reds? Well, absolutely good win the other day. The High Tower's attempts to come close to the throne ended with Aegon the Second's death. Yeah, so this is a thing that we don't really get to the bottom of. House High Tower are a big enigma, but they are survivors. This is fundamentally the point of the High Towers. The High Towers, George R. Martin has confirmed this now, are the oldest house in Westeros. They've been there so long that um, when house, when the High Tower, if you think in Old Town, you know, the High Tower in Old Town, when that was finally built, the the rumor, the legend, was that the person, the architect there, was Bran the Builder. Bran the Builder is the founder of House Stark. So House Stark started around that point. It's legend, but this is a good gauge. House Stark started around the point at which the High Tower was built, but the High Tower was not the first High Tower. There were four attempts before that. And the high towers were the house high tower were there before that. The high towers are an ancient house, and all through this time, their focus has been on survival, influence in a way that is not knocking over people, but it's it's being in sort of control and influence. They are in charge of the most by which I mean that they are the people. They are the principal sponsors of the Citadel. They are in charge of the Faith of the Seven, by which I mean that they are the principal sponsors of the Faith of the Seven. So the, they have stayed there all this time. And, and at no point during their history do we read of them attempting to take over the Seven Kingdoms. They seem very happy where they are. Until, until Otto Hightower, at which point they obviously launched this coup. Now, the most logical conclusion to all of this is that this was Otto. Otto was not Lord Hightower. Otto was not the head of the Hightowers. The Hightowers carried on regardless of what he was doing. So the clear implication that was that this was Otto going rogue. This wasn't the High Towers as a whole. Yes, they supported him, but this wasn't the High Towers as a whole going in in full support of Otto. So was this the end of the High Towers' attempts to claim the Iron Throne? Yeah, but also the beginning, because this was, an my reading at least, this was a rogue attempt by Otto High Tower. I think the High Towers would have rolled in behind it if uh, if they succeeded um, but they didn't um okay i think that's me caught up on the chat so let's go to some questions from my patrons um and let's first of all go to one from johnny targs saying hi robert it's been a while since my last question i hope you're well i am thank you. My question is, how do you think the show will reflect Aegon II after the events of Blood and Cheese? Um, so, as I said earlier, they, they don't give us all of the details. They don't tell us much of what happened afterwards. We're told that Helena um, 
took it very badly. You'd understand. I mean, seriously, a couple of assassins burst into her personal quarters, found her children, forced her to choose between them, and then killed the other one. Horrible stuff. Horrible stuff. Of course she was going to take this badly. Um, Aegon, we're not told. Except for one line. And I'll read out what it says in Fire and Blood. It says, the king raged and drank and raged. So the all we're told is that suddenly he got very angry and he drank. He couldn't he couldn't control what was going on and he was running around just you can almost feel he raged, he drank raged and you can almost feel him striding around uh, the red keep just desperate for some outlet how do we take our revenge and we're going to see this in season two otto's there sitting in his office and he's just scribbling these letters and saying, okay so maybe we can try and get the free cities on our side i'll write them a letter it'll take a couple of months for them to reply but that's okay uh which other minor house should we write to now? and and this is going to frustrate aegon immensely he is raging about this as i say we don't we don't know all of the psychology behind this was this an anger about his children never seen that close to them was this a slight against him as a person against his family we don't know all of the details but we do know that he got very very angry so how are they going to show that well it, it's worth reiterating and it feels like say this on most live streams but with house of the dragon it's very different to that in terms of adaptation how they adapted game of thrones in the early years let's say game of thrones season one had a seven eight hundred page book that they adapted in one season house of the dragon has 200 pages total that they're going to adapt over four seasons so Whereas Game of Thrones, where they're going, well, what bits do we leave out? When we come to House of the Dragon, it's a matter of how do we, I mean, if we're being uncharitable, we would say, how do we pad this out? What they did certainly in season one wasn't just padding it out, they had to add extra layers. So expect to see Aegon's reaction to Blood and Cheese to be developed in more detail than just he raged and drank and he raged. They will show us what that means. <coughs> Pardon me. Is he going to attack someone? I think he will take it out on the servants in some way. I think we're not going to like him. We might sympathize, we might understand. I mean, his child has been killed. We will understand, but I think that we're not going to like what we see. Um, let's go to a question from George R. R. Tolkien saying, I wanted to ask you about Kristen Cole's relationship with Aegon II. I feel like the show did not explore it at all. Do you think they will pay homage to this at some point? So this kind of ties into what I was talking about a moment ago. You're right. The book and the show, they don't really dig into this Kristen Cole Aegon relationship. What was it like? And this is important because he was the king and Kristen Cole was the Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Latterly, he was Hand of the King. So that is an important relationship. But it seems very clear that Kristen Cole, his key relationships were, first of all, with Rhaenyra and how he felt towards her, then how he transferred this across to Alicent, and also to sort of complete, I was going to, not quite a triangle, I've no idea what it was, quadrilateral or something, right? Then we get Damon, his relationship with Damon. We're not really told about Aegon, 
for him, Aegon's the next generation now. He's just the child. He's not the important one. So I think that is the, the relationship that we should be seeing. They didn't develop this much on the show. But I think this is where we should be seeing this. We do. Kristen Cole clearly has a grudge against Rhaenyra. Kristen Cole clearly has shifted his loyalty to Alicent. However, the impression that I get is that his hatred of Rhaenyra is greater than his loyalty to Alicent. So that is what is going to be driving him. With Aegon, the link across to Aegon is that Aegon is going to start getting angry. He is going to want to start pushing things faster. And what we've seen from Alison is that she's there trying to slow things down. Can we not have a peace? Let's do this in a, a proper orderly manner. Let's, let's make sure that everybody can see that Aegon is crowned. Let's see whether we can try and find some peace accommodation with Rhaenyra. Aegon's not going to want that. The moment we we're told, basically, the moment blood and cheese happens, he is angry. Kristen Cole is also angry. So I expect the show to unpack a little bit of this. The first few episodes, we're going to see um, Aegon um, starting to get chomping at the bit, angry with his grandfather. Why aren't we doing why are we just sitting here in King's Landing waiting for them attack? Why don't we go and attack them? And uh, Otto is just going to you know, just just be patient. This is how we win wars. The pen wins the war, uh, not the sword. And and Aegon will get angry with him, and he will look around for who is it who agrees with him, who can be his hand of the king, the person that he trusts, the person that he wants to be leading this for him. And he will come to the conclusion it's Kristen Cole. The only way he will come to that conclusion is if Kristen Cole shows that he is of like mind with Aegon. With, with Aegon. Aegon, so they have to show this somehow on the show. Aegon has to see that Kristen Cole is on his wavelength. Kristen Cole wants the same thing that he wants, and that is revenge. So they will show. I don't know how they will do this, but somehow on the show they're going to show that Aegon recognizes something in Kristen Cole that he wants. As his um. Richard Smith saying, do you subscribe to the theory that they are actually Eamon's children on the show? Um, so this is Aegon's children um, with uh, Helena. Um, now, the, the theory goes pretty straightforwardly. Aegon never shows any interest in Helena. Um, and he, uh, Eamon basically says, you know, if she were my wife, I would do my duty. Um, I'd make sure that we have heirs, da -de -da -de -da. Um, And clearly, Helena and Aegon don't really get on. So this has led to a theory among some quarters that maybe on the show, there's no real evidence for this in the book, but on the show, are they perhaps Eamon's children? Well, I don't think we have any evidence on the show either, is the short answer. Um, yes, they introduced those few extra lines, but that's basically building up to the, as far as I can see it at the moment, that's building up to the point where Aemond is thinking, I should have been king. It should have been me. We saw that a little bit when, when he captures Aegon and basically it's like, I, I should be king, not you. You're wanting to run away. Why are you the king, not me? We've already got that thought process going on. And that will reach its fruition when Aegon is hugely damaged, hugely hurt, milk of the poppy, rarely even awake, not lucid. Aemond has the crown for himself. And he's there thinking, right, I'm the king. 
in all but actual name. I'm Lord Protector. I'm the leader. That's what all of this is building up to. So for me, that's why they included those lines. It's This is about Eamon showing that he understands he would have done his duty. He would be the right king for the Seven Kingdoms. Is there any evidence outside of that that perhaps this is more, perhaps Eamon thought this would be a wise thing to be sleeping with his um, brother's wife behind uh, his back? No, there's no evidence of that. I can't see it on the show at the moment. Maybe they'll give us something in season two, but as it stands, no, we don't really have that. Um, Helena seems to tell the truth. She doesn't seem to be a person to be keeping lies. And, and um, uh, from what she says, that Aegon does sleep with her. So, yeah, there's no reason to think that they aren't Aegon's children. Um, Luna Cascade uh, question saying, after Aegon became king, um, were... Chamberlain now stay from his attentions. Did he at least slow down his creepy ways? So uh, uh, were the, the chambermaids, I, I assume this means, so were the, um, the serving staff. Um, well, we're not told, but the clear implication is that certainly after the Battle of Rook's Rest, then um, that's the point at which he's um uh, yeah he, he's not he's not physically able to do much now we are given this is a mushroom story so you know close your ears for those of a faint of heart but uh basically we're, we're told that once he couldn't have his uh, wicked way with anyone he wanted to then he would get um he, he would watch while other people do stuff basically so um Will we see that on the show? I mean, that's the kind of thing they like to show on the show, I think. So I think we probably will see that. But uh, did he change his ways? Was he still creepy? If anything, perhaps more creepy. Um, but certainly him heading down into Flea Bottom to have his wicked way um, seems to have ended. Um for a quick flick through the chat, see if there's any other questions going on in there. Uh, another view saying, poor Helena, love the greens here. angle they've gone with her, though. Yeah, absolutely. Helena is one of my favorite characters on the show. Um, one saying, if your super chat was missed, please hit up the moderators. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the chat goes through very quickly for me, so I don't always pick up on stuff. But if you, uh, if you let one of the moderators know, um, uh, Andrew Casing, uh, that it's a good point that the high tower plot it wasn't so much a high tower plot as House of the Dragon portrayed it. Um, the high towers actually did not go all in with forces or resources, no, they they, they didn't. It's, it's if they had wanted to push everything in, they probably could. Um, and yeah, let's go with a question from. Travis. Hello, Robert. I'm curious why Aegon II and Rhaenyra weren't wed. I know in the show they're almost 20 years apart, but from what I understand in the book, they're less than 10. Seems like it would have solved all the problems. I get the impression Alicent was quite pious, but she allowed her children to marry each other, so incest could have been too much of a concern for her. Make it make sense. Um, okay, so... Uh, this is why didn't Rhaenyra marry Aegon? Because surely that would have stopped the whole Dawn of the Dragons if the two of them had married. And it's a fair question, to be honest. Um, but it's one that's addressed in Fire and Blood. And this is this is what it's said. When we're looking at who should Rhaenyra marry, uh, we read this. Queen Alicent had her own candidate. Her eldest son, Prince Aegon, Rhaenyra's half-brother. But Aegon was a boy, the princess ten years his elder. Moreover, the two half-siblings had never got on well. 
Um, all the more reason to bind, bind them together in marriage, the Queen argued. Viserys did not agree. The boy is Alicent's own blood, he told Lord Strong. She wants him on the throne. So um, I think we've got three reasons, basically, why the, this match did not happen. The first reason is that there is an aid gap. Um, it's not the same on the show as it is in the books, but in the books, um, at the point at which Rhaenyra married, she was, I think, 17. Aegon was seven. Now, that is a big age gap, and uh, realistically, you're looking at, I don't know, another 10 years, maybe a bit less by Targaryen standards before marriage would mean anything, really. And by then, we're looking at uh, Rainier in her late 20s. This does not, the, the, the age gap was a thing. That, that's, we shouldn't pretend. Uh, Otherwise, Lenor, who she'd eventually married, the age gap was not the issue. There were other issues, obviously, but the age gap was not the issue. Uh, the second issue is that Viserys, although we often think of him as being very conflict avoiding, very perhaps not really seeing the issues, it's very clear from this he did understand. Alison wanted this because she wanted her son on the throne. And the implication here is that Viserys understood that when they were married, that would just actually increase Aegon's claim because he was the, he was the king, the king and queen, who the king, obviously. So this would just increase his claim, but he wanted Rhaenyra to inherit herself. So we got Viserys saying no. The third reason is that we look at these things with 2020 vision hindsight and we say, surely this could have saved the Dance of the Dragons. But they, at the time, that was still years in the future. This wasn't, this wasn't a thing. Yes, there were tensions between the two sides, but this wasn't the kind of thing that anyone realized could possibly ever lead to massive civil war. On the other side, however, there was a, a part of the family that had been repeatedly snubbed and were hugely powerful. That's House Gloria. Now, they've been repeatedly snubbed because, first of all, Rhaenys probably should have been made queen uh, or made heir years earlier and wasn't. Then Lenor should probably in the Great Council of World War been made heir but wasn't. Then we get um, the question of who Viserys would marry uh, when he was remarrying. Um, Lena Marion was put forward again a snub. The Valarions were the richest, the most powerful family in all of Westeros outside of the Targaryens. The, the Corlys Valarion is a living legend. He was he traveled further than any other Westerosi ever. He'd explored more, he'd gained more riches, his fleet was the largest. He was an astonishing figure. And they were sitting on the sidelines grumbling that they always get snubbed. The better political move at the time was to bring them into the, back into the royal family rather than worrying about um, Alison, who at the time was Viserys' wife, so they were already very much in the centre of the royal family. So this... It, it may look, we, we may look back on it and go, it doesn't make huge amounts of sense in terms of trying to stop the Dance of the Dragons. But at the time, they were probably thinking about, well, let's try and stop the Valarions from sparking a civil war. Let's go to a question from um, Colt Foster saying, hello Robert, afraid I won't be able to watch a live tonight, but an observation I made during my read of Fire and Blood is that the bond beyond Aegon II and Sunfire seems to be one of the strongest bonds between any rider and dragon in the series. Am I alone in my assessment? 
And what do you think determines how strong the bond between a rider and dragon is? As we seem to get quite a spectrum across the series, dragon riders. Related to this, Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. Um, my question is regarding the reunion of Aegon II and Sunfire at Dragonstone. Do you think this would have happened if Aegon was somewhere else? I.e., was the dragon there because he was just looking for a comfy environment, or was he actually looking for his rider? So, this is uh, one of the most fascinating moments of uh, the whole Aegon II narrative. Aegon had been rescued from King's Landing. Laris had sent him masterstroke. He'd sent him off to Dragonstone. Who would think to look in his enemy's stronghold? And he's there at some fishing village. It, we, we have to say, just for context, in, in the book, Dragonstone is bigger than it appears on the TV show. On the TV show, it looks like it, an, an island with a big castle and maybe like a few houses down around the port. That's D Dragonstone in the book is bigger than that. It's not a massive island, but it's bigger than that. There's there's a whole town around the port, and then there are villages dotted around the rest of the island. And Aegon, in disguise, with a couple of loyal retainers, goes to one of these little villages. No one will ever know he's there. He can cover up his uh, his hair with a nice big hat or something. It'll be fine. And on Dragonstone, there are actually quite a few people who've got Targaryen-ish looks. Um, this is where the dragon seats came from. So he was sort of hiding out there and probably would have carried on just hiding out there until we hear this rumour that Sunfire had returned. Now... This is an intriguing thing because it's just a sailor sees off in the distance a couple of dragons fighting. Um, Grey Ghost, who's one of the dragons that did not get tamed during the um, uh, the dragon seeds moment, um, and another dragon, and everybody this other dragon wins and starts eating Grey Ghost. And everyone assumes when the sailor tells the story that the, the dragon that won was Cannibal, this legendary dragon who's been living there on um, Dragonstone for who knows how long, absolutely never bonded with anyone, incredibly fierce and dangerous. Everyone just thought, oh, that's just Cannibal doing what Cannibal does. But Aegon's retainers noticed a detail in this account. The fact that the dragon which attacked the other dragon is described as golden. Now, Sunfire, this was Sunfire's distinguishing characteristic, is that Sunfire, Flyer, but Sunfire is a golden dragon, a beautiful dragon. And this was mentioned not just once in the account, but several times. And so they go to investigate. They go, this dragon apparently is holed up in one of the caves uh, on the Dragon Mont. They go and investigate. Sure enough, it's Sunfire. How did Sunfire get there? Why did Sunfire go there? We'll get onto that in just one second because the that's the point at which <coughs> Aegon seems to decide, you know what, I'm not just here hiding. I'm going to actually go on the attack. I am going to retake Dragonstone. I am going to chuck out the people who've been left here in charge. Um, and I am going to control Dragonstone. So this is a really important moment. But why did Sunfire head back to Dragonstone? Now, we're given a couple of broad reasons. One of them seems to be that this is Sunfire, who is injured really badly can't fly very far, um, just wants to go home, basically. And we've seen this with Beleriand, as Beleriand got very old. You remember when uh, Aria climbed on top of Beleriand? Uh, Beleriand seems to fly home back to Valyria. So this is a thing that dragons, dragons near death seem to think about. I just want to go home. I just want to go to the place 
I'm sort of comfortable, I like. So that seems to be a reasonable answer. The other possible answer is that Sunfire went there because it felt the presence somehow of Avon. Now, we don't have an answer to this. We don't, in fact, in Fire and Blood, repeatedly but we can't read the minds of dragons do things for dragons' own reasons. Um, but I, I would point out that um, when Dreamfire was um, attacked, Dreamfire didn't immediately try and go to Dragonstone. Dreamfire seems to go off and just try and find a place to hide. Um, when Dreamfire went to Dragonstone, Dreamfire didn't actively seem to seek out Aegon, just seemed to go to a nice cave and stay there. So there's no, and there doesn't seem to have been some kind of mental bond that is formed that, that Aegon goes, oh, I really think we should go and check out that cave. Now, all of that seems to suggest that probably the main factor here is just some player trying to get home. The show may do The show may give us another layer to this. They may show that um, uh, that Sunfire is desperately trying to get closer to Aegon, that Aegon can sense Sunfire close at hand. That doesn't come through in the book, but the show may decide to go down that route. So George R. Martin is, is very clear. There's book canon, there's show canon. He's trying to keep them as close as possible together, but they are Different. So, what I can say reasonably clearly is that in book canon, there is not much evidence to say that there is this extraordinarily strong bond that uh, Sunfire go and hunt down its bonded owner, partner, whatever you want to call that relationship, because it it doesn't. Sunfire doesn't go and try and find uh, Aegon. It just sits on an island that he, Aegon happens to be on. But on the show, I think they may well do this. This is the kind of thing they, they seem to like. They want to add to dragon lore. That much is very clear. And so this is the kind of thing they may they may play up a little bit. Maybe they will have... And I can certainly see the scene when uh, Sunfire hands there on dragon's bed you see Aegon something sort of looking at him going Wait, where's my dragon that kind of thing they can really easily show so I think they might they might go down that route um let's have a quick look through the the chat um Richard Smith saying, heading off to bed. Thanks as ever for the insightful analysis. Thank you, Richard. Um, uh, is Amami um, 37 saying the High Towers would have tried uh, tried to off Rhaenyra behind the scenes? Well, quite possibly behind the scenes. Um, uh, Kate was saying, it seems like I haven't seen your super chat. Um, uh, apologies, uh, Kelly Summers, uh, but I think I've got it here saying any link between the usurped Targaryen and Numenorean queens. Um, this, I think, Kelly is one of your uh, trying to mix up my two different uh, big fandoms. Um, is there a link when you're saying a link between the usurped Targaryen and the Numenorean queens? If you're talking about the um, Lord of the Rings. Um, queens after they got exiled from Numenor. I mean, there's there's the same feel. What what I will say that there, there's something that um, Tolkien. I'm not going to go too much into the Tolkien stream, so I'm not going to go too far down this route. But when Tolkien's talking about Numenor. He very, very, very strongly aligned it with Atlantis. He often called it in his own writing, Numenor, 
this as a, a one thing, a high word. So that is a clear thing in his mind. George R. R. Martin, when talking about Valeria, he talks that the two biggest inspirations are the fall of Rome and the Goth Atlantis. So that is definitely a feel. This great civilization that is now gone, we can't ever learn its secrets again. Um, that's a very Atlantean kind of feel. Under the sea, it's disappeared. So um, is there a thematic link between uh, Valyrians and Numenorians? Yes, definitely between the two. Um, is there anything more than that? I think I'll take that. Uh, let's go to a question um, from Martin S. saying, hello, Robert. Hi there. Uh, what exactly is Rhaenys' relationship to Rhaenyra like? I get the impression impression it is complicated with Rhaenys and Paul is blaming Rhaenyra for their child's death. Rhaenys does not seem bitter or vindictive. Um, uh, Lara Momo, hi there, new, new sub, uh, great to see you. Um, so the relationship between Rhaenys and Rhaenyra is it's fleshed out a lot more on the show than it is in the book. Definitely fair to say. Um, in, in the book, we don't really see huge amounts of the interaction between the two of them, is the honest answer. On the show, they, they, um, the, Rhaenys seems to have come to a, an acceptance of her history, her position, particular her position vis-a-vis -vis the establishment as it were she is the queen who never was and yet she can be there giving Rhaenyra these kind of words of wisdom warning whatever you might want to think of it as uh, she's there going uh, they will never allow on the night throne uh, what does what does she want Rhaenyra to do with that information it's never actually 100% clear I think in the show I mean she's just telling her that this is what's going to happen but um, on the show she's never a 100% in Rhaenyra's camp she's just that basically the what the showrunners have sort of said fundamentally in that scene which I know divided a lot of the viewership when and it was a show only scene when Rhaenys bursts up in the dragon pit uh, on her dragon maybe uh, but bursts into and interrupts the coronation and has the chance to kill uh, all of team green and decides not to what the showrunner said was that her thinking was this is not her war to start it's not her battle to fight and so she's to a degree quite neutral She's come to terms with her own past. I think she now thinks it's for Rhaenyra to forge her own past. Um, it's worth noting with the, the blaming Rhaenyra for her son's death, it's not in the book, it's not that clear. On the show, it's very clear um, that yes, they, they think everybody thinks that this is what happened. On the show, it, it's there's no evidence that this is anything other than a lover's tiff between Lainor and Cold Corey. Um, Cold Corey kills him and runs away. That's what it looks like. The question is, did somebody pay Cold Corey to do that? That's the only real issue. And the hint is maybe it's Damon, but we don't get this angry Rhaenys blaming Rhaenyra for it. So the show has um, given extra layers to this that there wasn't in the book. In the book, um, all of those things could be implied, but they're not they're not written down. The actual relationship between the two of them is never really spelt out. Um, let's go to a question from Alison saying, hi, Robert, on the show, Otto says to Alison that if Rhaenyra is made queen, 
she will eliminate, or she being Rhaenyra, will eliminate any competition to the Iron Throne, from killing, exiling, etc. Alicent's children. Do you think there was any truth in that? It's why the High Towers were so eager to get Aegon on the throne. Now, this isn't something that Rhaenyra ever threatens. This is showing you here. But um, is Otto right? Well, possibly is the is the honest answer because um Rhaenyra may not be suggesting that this is what she would do um but was Damon capable of it yes definitely um because take it five down five years down the road you've got somebody who lots of people think should be king what if Rhaenyra turns out not to be a great monarch? They're starting to get behind the other people. Would Damon have allowed that to happen? There to be a, a clear rival to the throne? Probably not, because at this point Damon is fully in Team Rhaenyra. It's his children who are there, um, in line to the throne um, uh, after the strong boys, obviously. But was Otto wrong? I think he's exaggerating. I think he's making assumptions, and I think there's also a little bit of psychological projection going on here, because I think that's what he would do. Clearly, that's when we go forward a few episodes, we see his first thought is, my guy's now king, how do I get rid of the rival claimants? You have to assassinate them. So he is thinking, that's what I would do. Of course, the other side would do the same. So is it fair-ish? Um, but we never, we never see Rhaenyra, particularly on the show. We never see Rhaenyra go down that route. Um, let's just take a very quick moment just to say, patrons, thank you. I always try and thank my patrons. This is why I shape these live streams around my patrons' questions. A reminder for those who need reminding: at the beginning of May. All of these live streams are going to be moving over to my second channel, IDG Live. If you've not discovered my second channel, there's a link down in the description. This main channel on uh, In Deep Geek is going to carry on covering all of the things that you love, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher, etc., etc. It's going to carry on doing that, but it's going to be just in the uh, properly curated normal videos. Everything live-ish live streams, interviews, uh, short-form content, that kind of thing. That's going to be happening on IG Live. So if you want to be ready for that, do go and subscribe to that now. Um, and the other thing I should probably say at this point is moderators. Are amazing. If you're watching this live, please, could you, and you're in the chat, please could you show a little bit of love for the moderators. Um, they do a fantastic job keeping the chat a safe place for everyone. So um, thank you. And if you're there, please do show them a little bit of love. Um, uh, Weezy Squeezebox saying second or third channel. Well, yeah, sort of third channel. I have another channel, um, which is uh, called The Bubble Tale, those uh, who like audiobooks. <coughs> it's, a, uh, it's a podcast but also a YouTube channel. Basically, it's me reading the best classic science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. If you like The War of the Worlds, Call of Cthulhu, uh, I don't know, The uh, Wizard of Oz, lots of stuff. Uh, Conan, that's all over there. So do go and check out um, The Well Told Tale if you like that. Let's get to a question from... Um, 444, saying Happy Easter, Robert, and to you too, and to anyone who uh, celebrates as well. It's uh, Easter Sunday, uh, as I record this, Easter Sunday coming up this Sunday. Are there any redeeming qualities in Pig on the Second? Or is he a strong pretender to the top three of worst Targaryen kings? Okay, so redeeming qualities, we don't really see them. Um, it's probably fair to say. So, um, is he in the top three worst Bulgarian kings? I mean, I don't think he's around for long enough to really qualify there. But 
particularly on the show, I have a feeling, given what they've done so far, with m most of the main characters that we dislike, it started to show us another side. We've already seen a little bit of it. He, he is brought up in great privilege, but he is bullied by his mother. He's also um, basically looked down on by his brother. Um, and he doesn't want to be king. That much is clear. He's He would probably, very happily, from what he said and from what we've seen, just have gotten a boat and gone away and left it all behind and just lived a happy life elsewhere. So this sets us up for this, if not thinking of him as a good person and perhaps understanding him better, perhaps having a little bit more sympathy for him. And, spoilers obviously, at some point relatively early in season two, I think we can expect to see him have some pretty horrific injuries after losing his son in a pretty horrific way and this is gonna be bad he's going to spend a huge amount of time in agony in real pain and he's not going to be able to do anything about that apart from getting the poppy basically be drugged up he tries to drown his sorrows in alcohol he then drowns them in milk of the poppy he he doesn't want what's happening. When finally he re-emerges uh, on Dragonstone, um, he has a there's a he has another dragon battle, and that breaks his leg. He can't walk easily enough. He's scarred. Half his body is already scarred. And then he gets a chance with Rhaenyra. It sounds really cruel when she comes and he kills Rhaenyra. He just wants an end to this. He just wants to get rid of everybody who's caused him all of this pain. His wife has committed suicide. Um, his children are dead. Um, uh, what? Where, where is he going to go with this? It, it, of course, he's hurting deeply inside. Does that mean that we say, oh, well, okay, that's all understandable? Well, no, obviously, he still is horrendous. But I think the show are going to make us understand a little bit more about why he is like he is so uh, I, I mean i don't know whether that really answers your question 444 are there redeeming qualities we don't see redeeming qualities but um i think we will see some extenuating circumstances that's probably the best way of putting it uh brendan saying long time since i've seen you live happy to be back hi there brendan good to see you too um indeed uh sorry andrew k saying he did want to be done with everything but his stubbornness actually prolongs the conflict and prevents him from cementing the victory yeah i would agree with that i mean it doesn't um it doesn't make him effective or good at achieving what he did. He, If he'd survived, the war would have carried on even longer. There's absolutely no thing at all. No, no way around that. I think it's it's very clear. He's not, his anger is not a positive thing, but it's perhaps an understandable thing. Um, Chris Ballerina saying, do you think that Aegon resented his mother for putting him and his siblings up to this? Well, quite possibly he did. Um, he didn't treat his mother well. Um, and his mother herself, again, this is spoilers, but she she survives the Dance of the Dragons. She, only for a short while, but she does survive it. But it's, when you read in fire and blood what she's like at the end she's just there locked in her room and just mentally destroyed by everything that has happened and she's she hates she doesn't want to talk about anything she doesn't want to engage with anyone she hates the color green uh, clearly she's been mentally destroyed by this he's been mentally destroyed by this this is the overarching message of the dance of the dragons everybody loses everybody gets hurt by this if they're not killed their loved ones are killed their lives are destroyed this is um 
it's a it's an, a horrific thing, and I think they will show this on the show. But what they will try and do is make us understand these mental breakdowns. Um, Alhad, do you think it is likely that Gaiman Palehair was Aegon's son? And did we get a glimpse of him in episode nine? So in episode nine of House of the Dragons, he's one of House of the Dragon, we get, if you remember when Eric and Arik are hunting for Aegon down um, in King's Landing, they end up in these kind of child fighting pits and uh, they're having this like to and fro about Aegon being maybe not the best character, maybe not cut out to be king, and we get a glimpse of a small child with Targaryen blonde hair, um, and we're told this is his bastard child, one of many. Now, we have no reason to disbelieve that. Cut forward in the books to after Rhaenyra gets chucked from King's Landing. She gets forced out. King's Landing descends into chaos for a while. And we have three people basically ruling the city. None of which, this isn't like team green or team black this is other people rising up to take control of the city and one of those people is game and pale hair or more accurately it's not him but the people um who are around him and they hold him up and say this is aegon's bastard child and he's the rightful ruler and then they pass these series of laws which if they're not binding laws obviously but they say what his manifesto is and you read it and go ah that actually a lot of those things make a lot of sense um i think this is george o. martin just having fun with this to say the small folk who came up with this um uh the, the women there that we're, we're told their sex workers come up with this basic manifesto which actually out of everything we see in fire and blood is probably the most progressive and good thing we see and obviously it doesn't end well. He gets rounded up, they get rounded up. He does survive for a little while. Is there a chance that he is Aegon's bastard child? I mean, I think it seems very likely. There's no reason to think he is. So <laughs> um, uh, is that the child that we saw? Almost certainly they may change the actor by the time we get to... Um, season four or whenever they introduce him again because more real time will have passed than uh, show time um but yeah that that is who we saw um mara lee saying rainero was eventually fed to egg on the second's dragon sunfire while the queen's son was watching why do you suppose that the king spared, spared the young prince's life rather than also feeding him to his dragon. Uh, so yeah, this is a this is an interesting one. So we get um, the end of Rhaenyra and uh, Aegon, Aegon, we're talking about Aegon the second, basically feeds her to his dragon. He's got to decide what to do with her remaining heir the other Aegon, Aegon the Younger, who becomes much later Aegon the Third. Um, what does he do with it? And he could have killed him too. He decides not to. Why does he decide not to? And it, it, we're told in Fire and Blood that this is his decision. He was encouraged to kill him and decided not. Which is relatively wise, because at the time... Rhaenyra's forces had not given up. Rhaenyra's forces were still pushing, them, regardless of the fact that Rhaenyra had been killed, regardless of the fact that um, Aegon was there, um, being held by the other Aegon. They, um, they were still going. So, and Corlys, who was still technically Team Rhaenyra, um, 
it gets complicated with Corlys, but he had blockaded the waters between Dragonstone and King's Landing. So this was the sensible option, not to kill him and actually just keep him a prisoner. It's the same kind of motivation that why did Rob not kill Jamie Lannister? Yeah, Jamie Lannister would have been a, a, I mean, a threat if he ever got loose. But you keep him, you have a bargaining chip. The Lannisters knew the same with Sansa. You keep, keep Sansa alive, they have a bargaining chip. So that was the thinking. They keep uh, young Aegon alive. They have a bargaining chip. Um, <coughs> just have a quick flick through the chat. Uh, Luna Cascade um, saying, is Mysteria Aegon's mistress of waters? If so, what is she saying near the end of the dance? Is um, Mysteria Aegon's mistress? Well, yes sort of, but she's, um, well, it depends on what you're talking about. Uh, she's uh, Rhaenyra's mistress of whispers. Um, so she starts out, and, and the show has padded this out a lot, I think in a really good way. I did a video a while ago, um, two or three weeks ago, about this impending spy war in House of the Dragon, because I think they've led up to this in a really good and subtle way. But she will end up basically being Rhaenyra's mistress of whispers. That's what her is going to be, which sort of makes her eggs working for Aegon the Younger. Now, uh, what does she ever work for Aegon the Elder, not really, because uh, they've got Larys Strong looking after Team Green. So that's the kind of the, the balance that we've got going on here. We've got a, a, a spy war which is about to happen between Larys's spy network and Mycerius' spy network. Um, Catherine Perseth saying, how would you describe the relationship between Aegon II and his brother Aemon? Is there a parallel to the relationship between Viserys and Daemon in the role and characters of the Elder versus the Younger Brother? Thanks. Yes, definitely there is a, a parallel. Walter Martin, I think, is very clear here. So Aemon and Daemon, the names echo. To start with, it's just where is the D? Is it at the beginning and the end of the word? So they are deliberately set up as being very similar characters. Second and child, um, but they're there, um, the greatest champion for their brother, but also you think perhaps they want that off of themselves, certainly in the books, um, riding these incredibly fearsome dragons and they, the two of them obviously end up, it is the two of them, one of the climactic battles um, after, after God's eye. So the echoes there are very strong. Now, in terms of the relationship then between um, Aegon and Aemond and Viserys and Daemon, the, the Viserys Daemon one seems to be a lot more choppy. Daemon gets um, chucked out twice, actually, uh, from King's Landing. He gets officially removed from the line of succession. That seems a lot harder. To, in the book, that seems a lot harder relationship. Whereas Aegon and Aemon, they're perhaps because for most of their lives, their parents are still alive. They they seem to be operating at a on the same level all the time. So um, it's the the relationships are similar, but the circumstances are slightly different because uh, they're the age differences. Damon and Viserys, they lived much longer without their parents, and that meant that Damon could go off and do whatever he wanted. Um, Aegon and Aemond, not so much. Their parents both lived until just a, you know, a, few, a couple of short years. 
years before they they died themselves and we saw Raymond went off and did his own things so probably if the situation had been different then it would have been very similar um Martin S saying it's a bit unusual, um, as it were, that Team Black is the good team while Team Green is the bad team. Usually in fiction, black and dark colours in general is associated with evil. Yeah, quite often, but one thing George R. Martin really likes the worthy things, but I think George R. Martin, uh, although most people came out, I think, from Fire and Blood saying, well, Team Green is definitely in the wrong, I think that he wanted to show us that both sides of the civil war were horrendous and it was the civil war itself that was bad george r martin he's not sort of opined on this for a long long time but certainly back in the day he was very much a pacifist and his dislike of war generally plays out all through what we see in a song of ice and fire and also in fire and blood the the message that we should take i think from him in terms of the Dark Dragons is that the war itself is bad. Everyone lost. No one was pure and right. We might say, okay, so Rhaenyra had the better claim, but does that mean that she operated well? Does that mean that she led a perfectly pure and good and right war? No, not at all. Um, in fact, when she was in King's Landing, incredibly she does not seem to be a good ruler. Perhaps in that time she would have been, but then and there she definitely wasn't. So I don't I don't think it's a matter of who's good and who's bad in George R. Martin's writing. This is war is bad, and both sides for prosecuting war definitely are bad. Uh, Stephanie Frederick saying blame it on the dresses, absolutely. Um uh, question from Morally saying it is said that Aegon the Second was killed by poison. Who were the men involved in the king's death, and what happened to them? So Aegon the Second arrives back at King's Landing. This is the end of his story. He's, he's killed um, Era. Aegon the Third is captured. He comes back to King's Landing. He's reached an agreement with Corlys. He comes back to King's Landing. Um, he's not well enough to even climb the steps of the iron throne but he's determined to carry on with this war his advisors say we could probably end this now you just sue for peace uh, and probably we could come to some marriage agreements and uh, it would all be okay you could certainly say but, you know, he goes through who's there Who's in King's Landing who was clearly on their nearest side right killing them now? Who is there still saying outside King's Landing still saying they're on um uh Rainier's side? In that case, the unaware. And he just keeps this up. While this is happening, basically judgment is marching down the King's Road towards them. We get the lads, this is the basically the Riverlands army followed by um the uh, whoops the, the the starks Clark and stark and co who are heading down from the north um and he's basically king's landing is absolutely gutted there's no real fences left anymore um and he's basically there committing them to carrying on on a war will just lead to more and more deaths at which point we're not told the details of this it seems that masters never got the, all of the they weren't involved in these um discussions but the the old hands decided you know what the best thing to do is just to kill Aegon. he's never he's he's clearly bitter he's clearly angry he is never going to stop fighting this war and this war has to end i i certainly hope in the show they capture this feel that at the end of it all there is a group of people who just go this war has to end and we should want to be on their side we should we should be able to look 
back and all of the carnage and go, these these people are in the right, whatever they did before, right now in this moment in time, them wanting to end the war is the right thing. And the three ringleaders that we know of, Paulus Valerion, Laris Strong, and um, this other guy called um, Sir Puck in the Fleet, uh, who he basically set up one or the other. He was of King's Landing when it was all in chaos, uh, but survives to this point. And the three of them, between them, seem to decide that he has to be killed and they poison him. So, what happens to them? Well, different things. Uh, basically, they all get charged, and this is when we get the air of. This is when we get Craig and Stark, who's there just wanting to. Um, dispense justice on everyone. Corlys Velaryon basically gets pardoned. Um, uh, we get uh, Alice Blackwood comes in and basically begs for pardon on his part. He's he's lived a long life. He's very old by this point. He just wants peace. Um, let's pardon him. Um, so Perkin the Flea gets sentenced to death. But then says, "Hey, I want to, I want to join the Night's Watch," and he's allowed to go and join the Night's Watch. Larry Strong is sentenced to death. Probably could have also asked to go and join the Night's Watch, but says, "I've lived long enough. Kill me." Basically, it's a really odd thing for a character who seems to have been committed to his own survival all the way through. It's a bit odd, which has led to various conspiracy theories by um, uh, various people that maybe he's, maybe he's a game changer or something like that. Maybe he knows that this is not going to be the end for him. But he says, yes, kill me. Just make sure that you chop off my foot. He's embarrassed. The club foot, his foot, has been, in the way it's described in the book, is more than on the show where it just seems to be sort of like a, an odd angle and he can't use it easily in, in the book. This is like a deep thing that he has to carry around with him in his perspective. And so he asks for that to be cut off um, so that he doesn't have to carry that on with him into the afterlife. So that's what happens to the three of them. But ultimately, their plan works because it's not just about killing the king. It's about um, they realize that Craig and Stark is going to carry on trying to prosecute the war. And so they managed to send off messages to all of the great nobles who were technically opposed to the crown, all for peace. Um, and so Craig and Stark has to kind of accept it. So you work behind my back, but you've managed to get peace. So I'm not going to go and invade Westlands and, and Castle Rock or whatever. So uh, they, in, in their own, in that bit of time, whatever they've done beforehand, in my mind, they were heroes in stopping the war carrying on. Um, AK Channel TV saying, did Aegon and Sunfire have a symbiotic bond? In the show, could Helena choose the child that dies in her dreams? But then blood? Could Helena choose the child that dies in her dreams, but then blood kills the other? Um, so, Okay, the, the, a couple of questions there. Did Aegon and Sunfire have a symbiotic bond? I, I sort of, I think I covered largely earlier. My take is that in the book, there's no clear evidence that this is a stronger bond than there was between a dragon and its rider, um, uh, other one. So perhaps. But they would have to show that on the show. Um, it's not a book thing, I don't personally think. Um, in terms of Helena and Blood and Cheese, this is going to be horrific. So, my general take is that, first of all, she's probably already seen something. Everything Helena says on the show seems to be. She talks about the beast below the boards. Um, the, the implication is that that she was talking about Melis um, on Rainis, who would disrupt the uh, coronation. But this could equally 
be talking about blood and cheese um, sneaking around in the hidden passages. I can't see that we're going to get blood and cheese without Helena having some sort of foresight of what's going on. They will almost certainly make it as horrific as possible so that and tragic as possible for her. I think I think of all the characters, Helena's going to get the worst of it because she's going to see every death twice. She's going to see it in her mind, in her vision first, and then she's going to see it actually happen. So um, might Blood and Cheese do the opposite of what she sees in a vision? Quite possibly, because visions aren't 100% true. Um, if so, it will be pretty horrific. On in the book, this is what really pushes her over the edge. She gets she gets hysterical. She um, uh, breaks down. I mean, it's a really sad time, and, and it's all completely understandable because she goes through terrible, terrible things. Um, but this blood and cheese is the moment that really impacts on her. Um, Reflective uh, rambling saying, please check sound connection very garbly. Um, I do apologize for that, everyone. And lots of people saying that the uh, audio is not great. Um, uh, apologies for that. I'm, I'm going to keep on going. I'll, I'll, I'll check the check all of that. Um, uh, hopefully, that will um, improve it. But uh, da, 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 da. let me know if it doesn't get better. Then I will try something else um uh, questions in the chat um brig 2630 saying um the game of thrones mod for the crusader kings 3 game will release uh an open beta on april the 14th Did you ever give it a try yeah i would give it a try um absolutely i think what i'm gonna do just so you know um I will try and make the last bit of these, uh, all, all of these live streams, I'll try and do uh, more sort of open questions. So we've been talking about the subject for a long time, and then at the end of it, I'll try and round out with a few broader questions on other things. But yeah, in terms of um, uh, Crusader Kings 3, I've not played it, uh, but this is certainly one of the things I may do on my new channel. IDG Live is looking to play a few games, but not just like new playthroughs. What I'd love to do is do like a, a nerdy talk through a game, if that makes sense. So um, maybe so there's a lot of, say, Lord of the Rings games coming through, like uh, the Gollum games coming out very soon. Maybe I could talk my way through that and just explain the lore and the history of where this is sticking true to Tolkien's world, where this is a few different directions and that kind of thing um so yeah it's just a thought i had um crusader kings 3 i know a lot of people do play that um and uh, do very much enjoy it um let's go to a question from uh mara lee saying how should we remember the king how would you describe his legacy this is last my um Aegon the second question. So if you've got any more Aegon the second questions, then now is a good time to drop them into the chat. <coughs> um, the uh, how should we remember the king? How sh how would I describe his legacy? I mean, his legacy is not good. It, there is not much there. He played his role in the single most devastating eighteen months in House Targaryen history. I think is probably the only way to say that. He did have a chance to end it and chose not to. Um, he had chances to be kind and chose to be cruel. It's very hard to pick a good thing to say about Aegon II, other than the fact that probably we should have some sympathy for him. All of the, the story that we have in the Dance of the Dragons, we have to remember that he had chronic pain through all this. He had seen terrible things. He had experienced horrific things. And um, does this mean that we can forgive him? 
No, but if anyone has been through chronic pain, if anyone has experienced horrific things, they will know that that can that can push you in directions you might not as a person otherwise go. So I don't think he started out as a particularly good person, but he didn't want this. And then when he sort of embraced it and said, okay, all right, this is the way I'm going to have to go, then everything went wrong his child got killed he um was uh, hurt hugely lived in pain for the rest of his life um his brother was killed his um another child was killed his wife committed suicide um his his father died his mother i mean you can you just go through this list everything horrendous was going on around him so should we feel sorry for him a bit? I think at the very least we have to have a human understanding of the extenuating circumstances. His legacy is not a good one. He was not a good king, but he didn't reign in good circumstances. I was less saying, I didn't mean to say Team Black was pure good. Uh, very far, I mean, I wasn't implying that you were, um, but uh, very far from it, clearly. But good and evil is usually relative in George R. Martin with a few exceptions, and it seems they were more right. Yeah, definitely they were more um, right uh, in terms of who had the better claim would be my interpretation. And as I've said before, in Fire and Blood, I think most people who read that before the show happened came out with a very clear idea. Team Black were in Team Green launched it. And so that, uh, I think there's no other the old way around that um uh yes they were team team green were more in the right um andrew k saying especially once uh and egg on the second had egg on the third as a hostage if he just allowed the betrothal the other faction would have had little justification to continue fighting yeah absolutely so he he was happy and wanting the war to carry on um, Kai Spellerina saying, were Aegon and the HT siblings, having a bit of a mind like yeah, apologies, neglected in the book, um, like the show, was Rhaenys' imprisonment during the coup meant to parallel Sansa's during the purge? Um, so I think Rhaenys' imprisonment during the coup, which was a show-only thing, um, in the book she's Drift mark. Um, I, I think this was partly at least to give us um, a different perspective on what was going on um, to show us what's happening with the small folk. Um, and then obviously also to give us that moment there with her confronting um, the coronation. So I think that's what they were going on. Is it a a parallel to Sansa in the books, um, possibly, but I think Rhaenys nice and Sansa are very, very different people. Um, and I think that the parallel is more a, a juxtaposition of somebody who is very clearly capable of, yes, she had somebody come and help her, but she was very capable of escaping, keeping landing herself, whereas Sansa was very much not. Um, were um, Aegon and the siblings neglected in the books like the show? I, I mean, if, if you're talking the Hightower siblings, um, uh, yes, I think is the short answer. The, the, um, the, 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 the book, we, we always have to come back, the book is a lot more concise. Um, so the, uh, the Hightower's we read a little bit about the other high towers in the book, but not huge amounts. They seem to be sort of holding back a, a letter or two that Otto sends to his brother, but not much. They they do cr generate an army and go marching towards the landing, but yes, they get opposition on the way, but they move very slowly. It's very noticeable that, the, that this isn't a a fast moving army just uh, coming in to try and they don't seem to launch a naval attack or anything. There's a lot more they could have done, they didn't. Um, 
So I think with that, let's go to a few broader questions on things. Let's go to one from 444 saying it was reported that HBS staff only works on the Targaryen Conquest series or film. Do you think this could be the next prequel under the banner of House of the Dragon? I have mixed feelings about this, as on one hand, there is more existing source material than for most of the other prequel ideas. Um, on the other hand, most of the first phase of the conquest is pretty repetitive. Almost anyone who tried to oppose Targaryen died by dragon fire, with the exception of Dawn. Um, okay, so this is the news which came out this week um, that uh, one of the things that HBO are considering for another spin-off is Aegon's Invasion. Now, the fact that they're looking at Aegon's Invasion is not new. This was one of the things we're told ages ago was one of the early ideas of a potential spin-off from Game of Thrones um, that um, had a little bit of briefing against it. It has to be said, um, somebody uh, said that the draft that had Aegon as being a bit of a drunken lout, a bit like Robert Baratheon, um, which I'm guessing probably didn't fit in with how George R. R. Martin would have wanted um, him portrayed. That initial idea seems to have got shelved. It certainly doesn't seem to have been one of the ones where about a couple of years ago we had this basically we had a list of the things that were under consideration. George R. R. Martin's been very open. He's, nine spin-offs under development he's talked about in the past. My, uh, since then, we've heard that a couple have been shelved. Uh, doesn't mean that they're never going to happen. But shelved. The implication and what makes sense from a financial perspective is that the two that have been shelved are the more expensive ones, potentially expensive ones being the one about Nymeria and the invasion of 10,000 ships, um, and the one about uh, Corlys Velaryon's voyages, nine voyages, both of which would be potentially bigger budget. Um, so we're now getting this, or oh, we're thinking about doing a invasion. <coughs> There's also talk about maybe we could tie this in with a film. So the idea might be, again, this is just sort of leaks, um, sort of investigative journalism. The idea seems to be up there that maybe we could do a film of, I don't know, The Doom of Valeria or something, and then follow that up with a TV series of Aegon's Invasion. Now, again, this isn't new. This was something that we've been told a year or so ago was the idea for House of the Dragon, was that, that this isn't just a show about the Dance of Dragons. Um, this could cover other things. Once they finish telling the tale of the Dance of the Dragons, they'll shift to another bit of Targaryen history, and the most obvious bit is Aegon's invasion. So um, I think we just wait to see at this stage. They, they will almost certainly greenlight another spin-off. Um, maybe two. Uh, these are not easy times for streaming services right now, but the fact that the first spin off from Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, has been such a huge success, they must try another one because they spent a lot of money. They spent $50 million just getting the rights to this. So this is, this is a lot of money and it seems like an easy win. And of this stories they've got other than possibly Dunk Meg, this is the one that seems most likely. So do I think it might work? It could work. Um it would work. I would agree what you're saying for 144 about the idea that yes, there is a sort of repetitive version. It's it's so one sided. The invasion is ridiculously one sided. It's basically three people coming in with dragons and one after one, people realizing that they can't really oppose dragons, and that's it. So I get that, but where this could work is in the people dynamic. They have to get the dynamic right between those three main Targaryens. Um, so yes, I could see it working. Yes, I can understand why they do it. 
they've seen that Targaryens and dragons get views. That's what they want. So perhaps it would not surprise me if they do that and an and they still progress with this idea of Duncan Egg, but Duncan Egg would would work. Well. Um, Rance saying, not on topic, but I wanted to recommend the film The Lost King. Saw it this past weekend and found it very enjoyable. Game of Thrones, Harry Lloyd plays Richard III, and as usual, it's top notch. So yeah, this is um, the there's a War of the Roses connection across here uh, with uh, Richard III. Um, I, I've seen the trailer and it's fascinating. This is a great bit of sort of history that they've tried to turn into a film, and I'm glad that the film, from what you said, uh, was an excellent one. Modern history. Richard III, you may remember from Shakespeare, um, he, he lost. Uh, he died. Last English king killed in battle, um, and they never knew where he was buried. It's just been lost to history until just a few years ago. In real life, um, somebody followed this great historical trail and came up with this idea that he must be buried there, pointing at a map underneath the car park in Leicester, uh, which is somewhere randomly in the middle of, uh, of the UK, in the middle of England. Um, and sure enough, there, there he was. And we've now found the body of Richard III, and he has now been given a proper burial. Um, and they've made this into a film. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad it sounds like a fantastic idea for a film. Um, and I, yeah, look out for it. Um, in the cascade saying a kingdom for a horse, absolutely. Um, George R. R. Tolkien saying salutations, Robert. Salutations to you. How are you enjoying Ted Lasso? I saw your tweet about finally getting Apple TV. I hope you get to check out seven at some point. Yeah, so I've just I've been holding out for a while on Apple TV, but I finally finally given in and started watching Ted Lasso which uh, I heard excellent things about. And uh, as of this moment in time, I think I've got one more episode to go in season one, and I can confirm it is both very funny and also life-affirming. It's, uh, it's one of those things that you can watch and just, it just makes you feel good. Um, and it makes you feel good. So yeah, I would, I would highly recommend it. Uh, as for Severance, I've only heard excellent things about Severance. So um, I very much, when I finish Ted Lasso, I will get onto that. Thank you. Um, now I've got one more question if you want patrons, so any more questions, uh, do drop them into the chat. Uh, Martin Siesta saying, hello, Robert, the prince, not the king, Aegon, is played by Ty Tennant. That would be the son of Georgia Moffat, the doctor's daughter, Jenny, and therefore the grandson of Peter Davison, the fifth doctor, also adopted stepson of David Tennant, the tenth um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, he is, for those who missed it, this is Titan, so the younger, um, version of, um, Aegon was played by Titan, yes, so, um, the, um, part of the great, greater Doctor Who family. Um, and on another note, how was Andalusia? I saw on the IDG Facebook page, that I was at Alhambra. Yes. So if you want, if you if you care about my travels and things like that, I can put things up on Instagram and Facebook as well. Uh, feel free to hunt for me there. I I'm in Deep Geek official on uh, Instagram. Um, in Deep Geek everywhere else. Um, and and if you want short content, probably next week I'm going to start doing TikToks. So keep an eye out for that. Look for in Deep Geek there. But uh, yeah, I went to Alhambra. Uh, just a, a little play with some friends in uh, Spain and also Toledo. Uh, both were amazing. Keep you a bit of a community group. And we loved them immensely. So if you enjoy um, looking at ancient you know, historical sites um, and you happen to be down in Spain, then please do go and check both of those out. Um, let's uh, quickly flip through the chat. Um, 
Kokosnok saying, now is the winter of a discontinued glorious spring. Um, uh, winds of winter, a dream of spring. Yeah, absolutely. I've not really picked up on that. But, uh, yeah, that, perhaps that is a George R. Martin nod to Shakespeare. Um, uh, the Cascade saying, Apple TV, watch Silo. Many alumni from Game of Thrones. Thank you. I will pick that up. Um, uh, Collective Rambling saying, my annual plea for people with Apple, Apple to watch C. I've not seen it, but I will take any recommendation from Collective Rambling. Um, Don Dism saying, hello, I found your line. Hi there. We're just unfortunately reaching the end of it, but uh, I'm glad you made it. Um, now, uh, Brian Samuel, say please read the Malazan series. I get that a lot. Uh, yeah, it's definitely on the list. Um, uh, one one saying or asking, do you believe our boy one one will die in the winds of winter? I feel sad saying this, but it probably will. Uh, I think that's it. Um, let's quickly so don zim uh don don dism saying i finished re-watching lord of the rings and the hobbit excellent i'm very jealous um and Stephen Frederick saying, as we slow down to the end of the stream thanks everyone for being here and joining in the chat okay yeah so with that i will start to uh to wind this one down uh thank you to everyone just a reminder that as of the beginning of may all of these live streams are IDU Live. If you don't know where that is, there's a link down in the description. There will be a link appearing just in a few seconds if you're watching that a bit later, somewhere in the middle of this screen. Um, next week, let's do a Lord of the Rings live stream. Let's look at one of the other characters in the Fellowship. I've already done, um, who have I done? I did Frodo, I did Pippin. Uh, let's look at Mary next week. So next week, we're going to be looking at Mary in our next stream. Then we'll head our back to um, working our way through the Targaryen kings. So probably we'll get on to Aegon the Third after this, um, who is character. Um, so we'll get into that. Um, if you uh, so, thank you, patrons. Thank you, moderators. You did an amazing job. If you are watching back a little bit later, appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to other live streams that I've done, and appearing somewhere around here is going to be a link to my Patreon which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care, and I will see you again next week.